Hey, Brandon here. Welcome to the channel and thanks for tuning in. Got a great show for you today. We are going to do a Senior Bowls Riser and Faller show for you here. My podcast co-host on my Devi to Dynasty, a football podcast, Jason DiRienzo, he was down in Mobile watching the practices this week. Super excited. We jumped on the podcast on Friday afternoon, did a recording. Feel free to go take a listen to that. He goes in depth of all the prospects that I'm going to talk about on today's show, but I'm going to take notes. I took notes during the podcast, and I decided to jump on the YouTube channel here. It's uh, early morning on Saturday. Uh, the actual Senior Bowl game is in a few hours, but I figured I would jump on. I'm going to look at the notes that Jason talked about and go through some of these players. I trust Jason's eyes. He is a recent graduate of the Scouting Academy, um, and he was super excited to go down there for the first time, and I'm going to try and join him next year. But you know, him and I have been talking about these players for the last two or three three years. That's what our podcast is all about. That's what we've been doing, scouting these players. So it's nice to be able to go down there, see these guys in person, um, go down and look at their skill sets a little bit. You know, we're not going to take too much away from, you know, the senior bowl. I mean, it is the guys are in shorts, so there's no tackling, um, that type of thing. But we're looking for movement skills, right? We're looking at about intangibles. I know Jason had many interviews with a lot of these players we're going to talk, I'm going to talk about here, where he went down and just had chats with them in, in, in the media day portions of the event. Um, and, and he came away with the press with a lot of people. And I'll try and mention that in his notes. But I'm just going to read through these notes um, of, you know, what we talked about on the podcast and figured I'm going to have some fun, do some good artwork here, have some visuals. So you play Dynasty. You play fantasy, and you're looking for a YouTube channel out there that is going to help you uh, with your rookie drafts, not only in 2024, but 2025, 2026, even 2027. Yeah, that's how sick we are on this YouTube channel. We go deep. Let's get to the show, man. All right, look, we're going to go by positional group here. And again, I'm just going to read Jason's notes, kind of summarize what we spoke about. And again, if you want to hear everything he had to say, feel free to hit our pod, man. It was a really, really great episode. All right, from the quarterback position, I think the, the guy that I think, and listening to Jason as well as I know the guy, um, he was most excited about Spencer Rattler. He felt that Spencer Rattler went down there and made the most money, right? That's what these kids are going down to do, to make some bank, right? Um, you know, Spencer Rattler has had a tumultuous career, kind of. I mean, he started off at Oklahoma, did a TV show early on, and people were criticizing his intangibles and his arrogance and, and whatever. I know Jason, I think, spoke to him on the field and said he was confident, um, but yet very, um, you know, modest and, and just excited for the opportunity down there. But what did he see on the field that made him a riser for him? He said his accuracy was better than the majority of the quarterbacks down there. His arm strength was evident, and we've seen him play at South Carolina this year. I mean, he could sling the rock all over the field. Um, he was confident. He really just made less mistakes than all the other quarterbacks. All right, he was one of the most accurate. Um, he spoke to him on the field, and like I said, he said he was he was just mature. He was seemed like he was ready for the moment, and it wasn't um, you know really too big for him. And the thing that he also said was he got better every day in all of the drills. So I think he's playing in the game today. Um, and we'll see what he does, but he was a riser for Jason, all right, in the uh, quarterback room. All right, Michael Penix Jr. was a faller for Jason, all right? He said nothing stood out, and he didn't handle the pressure well in drills. Now, the last game of the championship game, you saw him, and when he's under pressure, uh, Michael Penix Jr., his accuracy and mechanics really, to me, fall apart. We've spoken about that on the podcast a couple times. You know, what does that mean for our fantasy di dynasty rosters? It's I'm just not going to be in on Michael Penix. I mean, he went down there, and even under pressure in drills down there, his mechanics were a little wonky, and he just wasn't accurate and just didn't seem comfortable. And um, I don't know. I just think Michael Penix is junior to me is just an overrated NFL prospect right now. And the, again, from a fantasy standpoint, is he going to be on our dynasty rosters? I'm not sure. I don't see Michael Penix leading an NFL team. I mean, you know, he's been a he's a five-year player. He's been in a league, injury history, nonetheless, but he just lacked consistent accuracy all week down there in Jason's eyes. So, you know, again, this isn't where you want to go down there. He's should be one of the guys that is also down there, um, really making a name for himself, being one of the leaders out there. But he said Spencer Rattler played a lot better than him, in his opinion. All right, Mr. Bo Nix was also a, uh, a faller for Jason. <clears throat> Excuse me. He ran out of the pocket. He set a lot in the drills. Like, he didn't set in there and read his progressions. He was, again, um, he, he rushed the ball out of his hands a lot. His accuracy was not, a, a, you know, wasn't great all over the field. And this was really funny because he was talking to other analysts down there, and they said that he's got a nickname down there of Bubble Screen Bow, right? 
So if you look at the stats and you're a box score watcher, you're going to notice that Bo Nix had a really high completion percentage of 77 or something percent this year. It was really high. That's because most of his his passes were check downs and very short to the line of scrimmage. Um, you know, so it, this, this kind of this term here, this this is a note from his thing. He said that is he was athletic, but lacked finesse to his game. All right. So um, we know Bo Nix can run around. We know that he's a strong kid and, uh, you know, he's probably got the intangibles as good leadership and stuff like that. But if you don't got the accuracy and he's another one if you watch the game against Washington this year I mean his mechanics are also can be very very inconsistent so he was a faller for Jason um, Michael Pratt same thing he was felt, felt that he was a faller like if there was one guy that was going to go down there and make a name for himself and be like okay yeah there's Bo Nix here there's Michael Penix Jr. and Spencer Rattler but hey I'm here too he just didn't seem that he did anything to really make him rise in any of the eyes of the scouts, at least for Jason himself, all right? And I have a note here. He did nothing special to move up the draft board. There was no wow moments, and he thought that his lack of arm strength was pretty evident throughout the practices. So I'm not sure Pratt is going to be a player that, um, again, I'm not sure any of these four quarterbacks we just spoke to are going to become NFL starters. They all might be Desmond Ritter-type players. They might be Sam Howell, where they get an opportunity, but it doesn't really work out. I mean, that's where I see all four of these players. But excited for Spencer Rattler. It's been a long journey for him. Uh, He's had an up and down career in college. All right, let's get to the running back position. There was no really, uh, Jason said, there was really no pass pro drills a lot. We've seen that in the past at the Senior Bowl. Um, There was not many one-on-ones with linebackers. There was a lot of receiving drills this year, okay? So, uh, which is good because we get to see these running backs with uh, catching passes out of the backfield. And there was really only two players that I felt Jason got excited to talk about. And the first guy was Marshawn Lloyd, which was a big riser. He said here, my notes here say, he was the biggest winner of in the entire running back class, all right? He put on a show. He, you know, I say he either got sweet feet or beat feet in my scouting analysis, and he's got some sweet feet. And, you know, Jason was tweeting out some videos down there that he was taking that, you know, he stopped at the line of scrimmage. He's got that dead leg ability. He's got that lateral ability, explosiveness, and he really shined as a receiver. Um, and he also watched an interview. He didn't interview him, but he watched an interview, and he looks the part, looks mature, just looks like he made some money down at Mobile. So a um, guy that we're probably going to move up our ranks, as we know, it's not the best running back class as far as in our dynasty uh, rookie drafts. But Marshall Lloyd was probably, after this, could catapult and rise as we get to the NFL draft. Ray Davis, another player that Jason was um, really um, impressed with, especially his physicality, his build, Big lower half, solid footwork, he said here. He looked really good catching the ball. Like I said, they did a lot of receiving drills down there. And he said Ray Davis shined in the in the passing pro in the passing uh in the game. So you know, we play dynasty and fantasy. We want those guys that catch the ball out of the backfield, right? We want those PPR uh, running backs. So that's good. He said he wasn't overly impressed with his athleticism, but if there's a team out there that's looking for a in between the tackles, you know, you know, monster to you know lay the lumber and be that physical, move the chains, running backs. He said Ray Davis is going to fit the bill down there. But again, he was most impressed with his pass catching ability at two. So there's not a lot of other running backs that he felt really made a name for himself, right? So um, there was really two risers, but there's one more riser I felt like he felt that really kind of did well for himself. And that was Dylan Lobb. I think that's how you say his last name. He's a running back. Um, and uh, I think from New Hampshire, I, I believe, something like that. But again, as a pass catcher, this kid had 68 receptions last year playing in college football. And he said he looked really good. Big kid, physical, um, and felt that if he was used in the right scheme, he could be a great PPR, big PPR back. But he said he was one of the best pass catchers out of the running back room down there. Looked really natural catching the ball out of his hands. And think because of that, he increased as a riser that he could get his draft stock. That's how good he looked in um you know, with uh, running those, uh, the drills out there, catching the football. All right, so a follow for him, Rasheen Alley. said he looked explosive. He could win outside, but he just lacked the physicality at five foot 11, 204 pounds. He has like a slight lower half and didn't feel as though that, you know, he did anything down there that was going to really catapult him into this running back class to, you know, still a day three guy, most likely, middle of the round um, in day three. Um didn't seem to get too excited about him. Didn't do anything. Cody Schrader, also, I'm going to just have as a faller here. He looked good. Um, he was more athletic than he thought. Um, the physical presence. But he just didn't have many wow moments down there. 
not like, again, you know, comparing him to Ray Davis. And that's fine, right? I mean, maybe he's not a faller. Maybe he, there should be like a flat player, right? Now he's not a riser. He's not a faller. But he just didn't do anything to say, hey, I, you know, Cody, here I am. You know, don't forget about me. Um, and, but the guy that, you know what, he did come away impressed with a little bit. The last running back I want to talk about was Dijon Edwards from Georgia. All right. He said, you can't ever count out a Georgia running back. And that's true. I mean, the, the NFL loves Georgia running backs. They're, they're, they're Georgia tough, man. They, these are, they're, bull, they're bulldog tough players. He said he had underrated burst and acceleration. Um, again, in the past catching drills, he really excelled. He said he was average at the contact point, um, you know, with contact balance and stuff but he said he's got some spry to his game and he's a player that he's going to keep an eye on that could be a sneaky sleeper in the running back room and as we know the nfl seems to like running backs from georgia they seem to have at least somewhat success on making a 53 roster he may not be a dynasty asset for us or even a flex player but you never know right um you never know what can happen so keep your eye on him all right so let's go to the wide receivers right this is where the meat and potatoes i think of the excitement of this show is probably going to be um said there was a lot of drops throughout the week from a lot of players all right but the guy there's one two three four four players that he really felt stood above the rest lad mcconkey now if you're a listener of our podcast um, you know that Jason and I, we scouted Lad McConkey back on, you know, two years ago, and we've been high on this kid ever since, all right? He said his intangibles are off the charts. He did a one-on-one interview with him and just really, really enjoyed that interview. <clears throat> Excuse me. He said he checks all the boxes. He's, he confirmed what we've been saying for months, that he is a space creator. And, and the buzz out there on X right now is, you know, all the tweets and everything is that he was basically uncoverable. Um, but the one thing he did say that I thought was really interesting, on day three, they did red, drone, red zone drills. And he struggled a little bit on the red zone drills, on the one-on-one press coverage where, you know, you're in the red zone, you got to get to the end zone 10 yards, whatever, you know, I'm not sure where they lined up on the field, but he said he didn't handle press as well as he did. So that might be something to keep an eye on. Second guy that we wanted to talk about, Roman Wilson. I mean, everyone's, you know, he was probably the talk of the town in the wide receiver room. He said he was just uncoverable throughout, you know, he had a spectacular one-handed grab in one of the first day. He only practiced one day and then he took day two and day three off of practices because he said, yep, you guys saw what I could do. I'm out the door. So good for him. He doesn't want to risk an injury. He showed everyone that he's twitchy. Um, He's just a fluid separator. I see in Jason's notes here. Um, And uh, he said he definitely made himself some money, which actually he thought we discussed on the podcast that he might even now be a day two selection in the NFL draft. Ricky Pearsall, Florida wide receiver, um, said he was able to consistently separate on the field and had an excellent catch radius. He was impressed with Ricky Pearsall all week. He said he also made some bank this week. Um, to, in, the, in the route running drills, he was consistently getting separation and he was really good at the catch point. He went up and made some really nice grabs and had some sticky hands. So Ricky Pearsall, you know, a name that didn't really, wasn't really, really that productive at Florida, but this is where these guys get an opportunity, right? Did this whole senior bowl is like made for these wide receivers, right? Because they know where they're running. The DBs don't. So, um, you know, if this, if this whole practice scenario is good for one skill set position, it is the wide receivers. Last guy uh, he wants to talk about um, was Luke McCaffrey. I just put on this YouTube channel a scouting report on him a few days ago. Got a scouting report on a lot of the guys that we're talking about in here as well, so go check them out. He said his catch radius was ridiculous. He has sticky hands with good technique, tough, scrappy player. He had a really nice reception from Michael Penix Jr. in the back of the end zone, and he said his intangibles were off the charts. You know, he sat in on a bunch of interviews. The guy's intelligent. And listen, man, this is Christian McCaffrey's, and I said this in my scouting report on the on the video is that he's got the bloodlines of Christian McCaffrey, man. His dad was, you know, uh, the receiver for Denver. His brother's playing for the 49ers. There's no way this kid is not going to get drafted probably earlier than he should. Um, but he's going to be a great little possession receiver in the NFL. I really believe that. The dude I mean, is rocked up. I mean, he is physical and tough. And if he's got good hands and can separate even a little bit, he's going to get on a 53 roster and he might make it to our dynasty rosters. All right. So the one guy I was most excited to see out of the wide receiver room, I have been a Malachi Corley believer. I love the kid's physicality. He brings something different to this wide receiver room, given that he's 5'11 or something and 215. Don't know exactly what the measurements are. But my big question to Jason was, when you go down there, man, see if this cat can get open on route running. And I came back. We talked on the podcast. 
wasn't super excited with what I heard. He said he struggled a little bit on one-on-one drills, creating space, but he has the speed. He's got the play strength. And then I, I was on X this morning, and he got uh, Malachi Corley got nominated by, I don't know if he was on the East or West team or whatever they call it, that he was the best wide receiver on that team. from, And that was the defensive backs who were actually, you know, going against him in the drills. So... Maybe he didn't separate all that well, but given his physicality, he's got some traits that are really interesting to me. I'm still, you know, again, I'm not going to overreact that he didn't get over him because, I mean, you know, he's got some time to continue to, you know, work on that. Um, Everyone's trying to compare the kid to Debo Samuel, and I wish they would just really stop it. You know, Debo Samuel is just a a player all to himself, and people have to stop the comp um, of him. Um, but in any case, Mile Cali Corley is a guy that I like, but I'm going to have to put him as a faller on this one because the route running, Jason, I could tell, uh, wasn't too impressed. All right. Brendan Rice, Jason had him as a faller as well. He said his dad was there this week, which was pretty cool. Got to see him talk to the media a little bit. Um, said he's physical, um, but he really had trouble at the catch point with the body control and adjustment going up and getting the ball. He stacked the defenders well, his notes here say, and he says not great athleticism at the catch point. So Brennan Rice was a riser for a lot of people, but for Jason, he didn't feel as though he went down there. Yeah, he's physical. Route running, he said, was average, not an elite space creator. So he's going to have to win with that physicality. But what he saw at the catch point on vertical plays, trying to adjust to the ball on underthrown balls over each shoulder, you know, thought he was just a little bit of an average. So we're going to put him in the faller category, at least for our show here. All right, and the last three guys we want to talk about are all fallers. Xavier Leggett, um, it's not, you know, I'm probably not telling you anything if you're into this kind of stuff. Uh, Leggett had a struggle for the first uh, day or two. I think day one, Jason said he really didn't play well. Day two, um, you know, a little better, and then he got he got dinged up. But this is one of these players to me that I feel has been just overhyped for, for months, okay? Yes, he had a great season, Um you know, at, at South Carolina, and he's, I think, a fifth-year player. In his first four years, he's done nothing in college football. So he's a late breakout type player. Everyone thought he was 6'3", 6'4", and had that speed, but he came in, I believe, at 6'1", um, and that kind of changed the game a little bit, I guess, the height for everybody, and I can understand that. If you're that tall and that fast, you're kind of, like, unique, but um, Jason here in his notes said he's an average route runner, and he had to work hard in parentheses on his breaks, and it didn't appear natural. So um, then he got injured, and then he didn't play. So Leggett didn't do himself, it looks like, any favors going down there and competing in this um, in this uh, senior bowl practices. All right, Devontae Walker, another guy that I believe has just been completely just overhyped as well as a faller. They, Jason, his first note here, he looked bad all week. He said nothing stood out, one-dimensional. He's a vertical run guy, um, out-muscled throughout his routes continuously all week. He said he's the next Diami Brown. So there you go. Uh, there's Jason's uh, scouting report on Devontae Walker, somebody we're probably not going to um, get too excited about through this draft process. Now, Jacob Cowing is a player that I've really liked. I mean, he was really productive at Arizona this year. I mean, his final game of the season was just spectacular. He simply won that game for Arizona. Comes in at a five foot eight, 165 pounds. Um, so people were kind of being like, huh. you know, if you're the, coming in that small, man, you better be special at something, either speed, physicality, something, right, to, uh, you know, make up for that short stature and light frame. Jason said he had drops throughout the week um, and actually went down on the field and saw him and was like really concerned about his frame and just thought like, hmm, this guy is tiny, and really didn't stand out this week. So Jacob Cowling probably didn't do himself any favors going down there and um, really competing. So he would be another faller. So that wraps up the wide receivers that we spoke about on the podcast. So let's get to the tight ends. And again, one player talking about, we're going to talk about four tight ends here. The one tight end that Jason got is, got excited about. I can tell when Jason gets excited about players uh, was Theo Johnson, the Penn State tight end. All right, he was a riser. He's an imposing figure here, looks like a tight end, natural mover on the field. He's got underrated speed, dominated blocking drills. He's raw but has untapped potential. And we spoke about that on the podcast. Leo, did you, Johnson just kind of emerged this year, and I think he's just been underutilized at Penn State for a long time. So 
he feels as though he's his biggest riser, that that's somebody that we should be keeping an eye on that could be, you know, this tight end class after Brock Bowers, Jatavian Sanders, you know, maybe Ben Sinat we're going to talk about here um, in a minute. You know, know, it's not a great tight end class, right? Last year we got excited about all the tight ends, right? This year we got, we're top heavy with Bowers. And then we talked about on the podcast that Theo Johnson could be one of these guys that um, might get unexpectedly higher draft capital than we expect. Ben Sinat, um, was a riser as well. Now, Jason and I have been critical of him watching his film. We watched some all 22 film on him, thinking that maybe he wasn't as, as athletic as, as he said, but I think Jason came away very impressed and said he caught everything that hit his hands. Um, he's a little short for the tight end position, but he was a good mover in space and is a clear riser. He and Theo Johnson really, really shined um, in the drills. The last riser for him was J- Jared Wiley um, from TCU, said he is the most rocked up, physical, imposing man he may have ever seen that this guy we talked on the pod he said don't mess with this guy i mean he looked the part of a receiver and he was really really impressed by his movement skills now jason and i have not watched a lot of wiley um you know we haven't gotten to his rookie report yet which we do on our podcasts and all that stuff and he's on the list but we got a few months but he came away pretty excited that he's like, you know what, this guy can play and he might be a little undervalued right now. Not enough people may be talking about him. So he came away impressed with him. All right. The last player we're going to talk about on the show is a faller in the tight end room. And that is Jaheim Bell, Florida State tight end. And really simply, he felt that he was getting beat off the line of scrimmage. He couldn't, you know, defeat press. He's an undersized guy. So he's not going to be a typical tight end blocking on the end, which means he's going to be, you have to be used out in space as a halfback you know, out in the slot, get him out in space and said he really struggled against press coverage um, with that frame because he's like an in-between. He's not really big where he can physically win, but he's not super small and quick and agile and felt that, you know, where does he fit with that small frame? Um, You know, if you're not going to be on the end of on the line of scrimmage, certainly understandable. Well, then you better be able to create space against a receiver, a linebacker safety, which is what he'd probably be most likely going up against a linebacker and safety. And he said he just didn't seem to separate consistently in the drills down there. So, all right. So that was the senior bowl stuff. And I guess two other players that maybe we'll just kind of talk about real briefly. Here's Malik Washington and Taj Washington. They played in the Shrine Bowl. Um, They weren't invited to the senior bowl. Two players. uh, Taj Washington is someone Jason loved. Man, he is in. I think his, he said he was number seven or eight in his top ten wide receiver rankings. And uh, Malik Washington, I got a scouting film on him on this YouTube channel and a couple highlight films. Go check him out, man. Jacked up little guy that uh, could make some noise too. It's a shame those two weren't also at the Senior Bowl, but I figured I'd just throw them in as risers and fallers for these two games. No one else uh, from the East West Shrine game that I, I kind of really want to talk about. So there's the show guy again. If you appreciate it, man, hit that subscribe button, man. I did a lot of work putting this video out in a short amount of time. Would appreciate any like, any subscribe to the channel. And um, hope you enjoyed it. Talk to you soon.